and I'll share my screen. Um, and um, we'll go to um, Google. Okay. Um, I've got quite a rich list of words to, to work through. Um, which we won't get finished today. But, yeah, we can do half of it. Or yeah. Three, four, two, four. Yeah. Okay. So the first one I'd like to teach you is an expression, which is, it is what it is. Have you guys heard that? It is what it is. Not actually, but I think I can guess the name. I mean, it's very clear by the phrase only. It's the reality or something. Yeah, so we'll avoid the pop song thing. It's an expression used to characterize a frustrating or challenging situation the person believes cannot be changed and must just be accepted. Now this is really common. You would hear this expression maybe twice a week. I think I've heard it twice in the last week, right? It is what it is. It's almost like a fatalistic kind of thing where you just, that's it. You know, you just, okay, can't do anything about it. It is what it is. It is what it is. Very common. That makes sense? Yeah. Thingy, you get that? Yes. Yeah, okay. This is a good one to learn, good one to practice. It is what it is. Right, next expression is, I think did, I might have done this already, first blush. Yeah, I think I did actually discuss this in class on group. And yeah, but we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it now as well. First blush. Anyone? What does first blush mean? First love or what? Speak again, Anjali. Oh, is it is it first love? No. Okay. No. Um, It's the first, first glimpse or impression. His next decision was at first blush disconcerting. So the idea, I, I think where this comes from is sometimes if you see somebody, you know, like say a boy sees a girl and he finds her very attractive, he might blush, you know. Um, I know in India you don't blush as much, at least not visibly. <laughs> but we uh, fair-skinned people blush quite easily. Our skin goes red. And it's a sign of embarrassment, slightly embarrassed. And so it's a way of saying at first glimpse, right? At first glimpse. Um. First, I'll maybe, I'll maybe get it in a sentence. At first blush, we thought it was an elegant restaurant, but it soon became obvious that it was hardly the place for a special dinner. Or at first glance, the contract looked fine. Right? 
that's the idea. At first blush. The comment brought a blush to her cheeks. I don't want blush. I want first blush. It seemed a good idea at first blush, right? At first blush, this sounds like good news. At first blush, this is a compelling concept. This may sound strange at first blush. At first blush, this discovery seemed to confirm his theory. At first blush, the offer seemed attractive. So you see how it's being used, right? It's, it's very common, very common. Is that clear? Yes. So yeah. Clear. Yes. Okay. Good thingy. Hi, Raheli. Nice to see you. Uh, hi, Tudra. Hi. Thanks for all your. Hi, uh, thanks Thank for all you. your. Thanks for all your comments in the group chat in the last couple of days. You keep you keep me busy. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you put an apostrophe in it? <laughs> Did you get that right? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Excuse me. Slapping the hands of teacher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Move her to the bottom of the class. <laughs> Trouble, <laughs> troublesome student. <laughs> right, very good, very good. You keep me on my toes. You keep me on my toes. There's a good expression. Keep me on my toes. You guys know that expression? Keep me on my toes. No, I don't know. Okay, well, that's a good one to know. Um, to cause someone to be, be alert and prepared to deal with problems, the boss made regular inspections to keep the employees on their toes. See that? So, like, if you're on your toes, if you think about it, like, you know, you're just about to move. You see, you're standing, but you're just on your toes. You're just about to move. So we use that expression idiomatically to mean you're ready you're alert yeah you can't really relax you have to be on your toes so here's some examples If he just watched out and kept on his toes, he'd be sure to get it. Kept on his toes. Ready to deal with anything that might happen. We were all on our toes waiting for the game to begin. Someone or something that keeps you on your toes forces you to continue directing all your attention and energy to what you're doing. I work with people who are half my age so that keeps me on my toes. I could have written that statement, right? In this class, you guys are all younger than me. So you keep me on my toes. Okay. But why is the age factor? What? Why is the age factor? Does it mean that people who are younger have uh, more energy? Yeah, yeah, brains are sharper. But in our, but in our case, uh, it's like contrary. No, no, it's not. <laughs> no, you have a lot of energy and a lot of patience, oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's because my students keep me on my toes, see? Eh? <laughs> yeah that's a good expression i win <laughs> i win <laughs> yeah yeah so keep me on your toes good good uh common expression right um right so 
We're going to do a really simple word here, right? But we're going to contrast it with another word. What does the word cheap mean? Cheap. Cheap means, means is something. I mean, yeah, yeah, go on, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, opposite of expensive, you correct. can buy easily, yeah. Correct, correct. So that's true. That's true. Now, I, but, but I want to look at another word and then, then we're going to compare them, right? What does affordable mean? Uh, you can buy it. Yeah. You can afford it. Yeah, correct. Right. So that's true. Something uh, that doesn't make a hole in your pocket. Correct. Right. So both <laughs> of the things are correct. Now, but now the question comes, what's the difference between cheap and affordable? As you can see that those both those words are very similar. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Now, but there's a connotation of something that's cheap that you don't get an affordable, right? There's a difference between them. There's a nuanced difference between these two words. And I want you to know what that is. So I want you to guess what it is if you can. And if you can, I'll explain it. What's the difference between cheap and affordable? Mm, it's the value attached to the product actually which is uh, if something is cheap there is a negative connotation that uh, it's not the as per your standard but if something is affordable it's as per your standard see see what I mean see that's just a perfect answer that's just absolutely great yes to say something is cheap and um, has a kind of pejorative uh, implication. So I could say something is cheap and plasticky. Cheap and plasticky, like made of plastic, not valuable. So, or, or I might say another expression we would say is cheap and nasty. Cheap and nasty. Right? But affordable is just saying, oh, it's possible to afford it. Um, so if you got a new car and you showed me a picture of it, it was kind of small, it was your first car. Um, I, I might say, well, it's great that you can manage that. It's just, you could say to me, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually quite affordable. See, it's quite affordable. Um, or you could say it was quite cheap. Actually, I bought it secondhand. And that's not putting it down, right? That's just talking like it is. But you might say to me, well, I'm actually looking for a, an apartment. So I've been viewing some properties and I went to see one yesterday, but I decided not to take it because it was cheap and nasty. You might also say something was cheap looking. Cheap looking. And that means it doesn't look like as much money in it. And, and it's sort of a bit pejorative, right? Cheap looking. So that's the difference between cheap and affordable. Let's see if we can do. Um, One of these comparison things. Um, sometimes these things are explained really well, and sometimes you don't get any light whatsoever. There's another expression is cost effective, right? Cost effective. Well, let's let's have a look yeah, at this. Mr. Lacar. Yes. Can we use affordable by this meaning? Affordable might be expensive, but um, it still is worthwhile to buy. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. We might say it's a good investment. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
So, so this is what is coming up on this website here, High Native. Um, affordable, a price that people can pay. The price is good, reasonable, cheap. The price is not expensive. It is more than affordable. Cheap implies low quality. Affordable means you're able to purchase it without causing a problem to you financially. Something affordable does not have the same negative connotation that cheap does. Cheap implies low cost and low quality. Affordable implies it's reasonably priced. Okay? I think we've got this. We've got this one, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, now, I want to do three words now in succession, which all have... They're in the same, the same milia, right? The same milia, the same ballpark, right? And these words are tenure, duration, and period. Tenure, duration, and period, right? So um, let's do the words uh, from the simplest probably is period, right? What's a period? What does that mean? I don't mean this. I mean, just a period of time. Right, so a period is an amount of time, a time period of 30 days, hastened the period of recovery, Picasso's blue period. So you might say it's a time frame. Right. When I was at school, our day was divided up into periods. You'd seven periods in a day. And uh, where you get first period? Oh, I'm in I'm in English class. Second period, I've got PE. A period, right? So it's a it's a duration of time. Our periods were one hour. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Now then you've got this word duration right which is similar but duration is specifically meaning how long something is going to last um so so you might say alan what's your favorite movie and i might say lawrence of arabia and you might say, I've heard it's quite long. What's the duration of that film? You wouldn't say, what's the period of that? You would say, what's the duration of it? And in other words, how long is it? And I would say, oh, it is really long. It's about three hours or three and a half hours. So if you said to me, what's the period of that movie? What you'd be asking is, when is it set? And I would say, oh, it's set in first world. It's set in first, the time of first, the first world war. And it's a true story about a man called T. E. Lawrence, who was an Englishman, and he went out uh, to Arabia, and he set, he incited the Arabians to fight against the Turks, who were in league with the Germans. And it's a really interesting story. He became very famous and he became known as Lawrence of Arabia. Really interesting story. What period is it set? First World War. What's the duration? It's three hours, a three hour movie. Okay. Everybody with me? Yes. Excuse yes. me. Uh, I guess period wants to point to two different spots in the context of time, am I right? Yes, yeah, multiple. It can be a period, the period of the First World War, right? That period, or you could say uh, the Roman period, right? Looking back in time, that's one meaning. Yes. Uh, it can also mean, well, let's look up a dictionary meaning of period, right? Um,
a length of time, right? A length of time. Her work means that she spends long periods away from home. There you go. Um, unemployment in the first half of the year was 2.5% than in the same period the year before. So the same period is regarding that same duration, right? A six, a six month period, right? In the previous year. In school, that was the example I mentioned, a division of time of day when a subject is taught. We have six periods of science a week. Yeah. A fixed time during the life of a person or history. Most teenagers go through a rebellious period. The house was built during the Elizabethan period. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, am I right? Um, period wants to say this time starts here at this point and ends there at that point. Yeah. But the duration wants to mention to a specific line in the context of time. Yes? Sort of. Duration has always got to do with how long the period is. So the duration is how long it is. It's one minute. It's one hour. It's one day. It's one month. It's that's the duration. The duration is the time between the beginning and the start point. That's duration. Period. Period describes the fact that you've got a period of time, right? And it can be something like an hour in school, in the context of school, you know, many periods are in a day. And it also can be a longer period, like a period in history. And, and, and an example here is, she spends long periods away from home. So it's, in, it's, it's indefined how long those periods are, but there's periods, that, a length of time that's bookended, it begins and it ends. And it's that statement is simply saying those periods she is spending away from home. Okay. Uh, Winston Churchill had a period where he was in India um, during the First World War. Are you comfortable with that? I think yes. Okay. Thank you. So we've got period and we've got duration. And so the last one I want to do in this sort of section is tenure. Tenure, which is similar, but not the same. Being a legal owner of land, a job, official position, or the period of time, this is why it's similar, during which you own it. During this tenure, during his tenure as dean, he had real influence on his students. So that's describing a period of time, but it's using this word tenure. And the idea of tenure is it's a period of time where there's an association. So you're taking time and you're saying you're associated with something. So it could be a job, it could be a university. It's used a lot in universities in the States. And you talk, it, it's actually an attribute given to people. And it said that he's a tenured professor, right? Which means he is in some way got a key role and he's got the right to remain, the right to remain permanently in a job, tenure. She is one of the few people in the English department who has tenure. So that's what it means strictly, strictly in a academic sense. But 
we would also use it slightly more informally to say that somebody's been doing something for a long time. We would call that tenure. Like I know this guy in Glasgow, he's retired now, but he was the, ran the Department of English in the University of Glasgow. And I might add, he had real tenure. I, he's not a debutante, someone who's just started. That would be the opposite, a debutante. Do you know that word, debutante? Yeah, someone who is a newcomer. Right. A rich young woman who, especially in the past in Britain, went to a number of social events as a way to introduce to the young people of high social rank. A debutante. 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 You might have heard the debut, your debut. You know, like when people are, there's new movies come out, they talk about the debut, don't they? The debut, which is the first showing of the movie. It's a debut. Um, but if Anjali came to visit in, the, in London and I took her around and introduced her to some people, some of my friends, she would be a debutante. So here's examples. Already we see the drawing and trying as the appropriate form of expression for a debutante who has great aspirations but little practical experience. So debutantes often have great aspirations but little practical experience. I feel like one debutante congratulating another only slightly later in the season. If debutantes were missing a figure in her life, such as a father, they chose their 18 white roses in place of that figure. There were no debutantes as all teams played in previous editions. Debutante. Okay. Now, I want to do Again, two words and, and do a comparison between them. Attitude and character. Now, this is an obvious kind of word. What does attitude mean? Someone's demeanor is attitude. Yeah. I think a way of thinking. Yeah. A settled way of thinking or feeling about something. This meaning here is a very North American thing. We would say it in the UK as well. I asked the waiter for a clean fork and all I got was attitude. So that's that's short for bad attitude, right? The waiter is kind of protesting that I'd asked him to do such a menial task, right? I wanted a clean fork. So, attitude. Um, and I want to contrast that with character. What does character mean? A collection of your thoughts, your feelings, your traditions, your genome. <laughs> <laughs> your genome. Mm. Yeah, I think it's more to do with your... Um... Have you heard of the expression nature versus nurture? No. Um, we'll come back to that, right? Let, remind me, let's, let's do nature versus um, nature versus nurture. I'll do that in a minute. Um, 
you'll see why I want to get to that, why I keyed on to that expression from what you said when you said Gina. Right? So your character is the mental and moral qualities distinctive to you as an individual. Running away was not in keeping with her character. Giving up on English is not in, in Angeli's character. She's quite, you know, dedicated. Okay, as our character is marked by that. So that's one meaning. Another meaning is this, a person in a novel, play or film, right? The author is compassionate identification with his characters, the characters in his book, right? Or I might describe someone and say, he is a real character. So I'll, I'll use Sud's name since he's not here today. Sud is a real character, right? Sud or Sud. Sud is a real character. Anjali will agree with me, right? Yes. <laughs> See, so that's, that's saying that they have a certain attitude and you sort of, they're distinctive, right? right. Okay. And then, of course, there's an expression which I often quote, which is a, a very lovely quote and very famous by Martin Luther King, who said, I want to live in a nation. where my four little children will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I think he said it all the way around. Will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I like that expression because it's also an example of consonants, which you've explained in a previous thing. But if you think of how he's using the word, what he means there, the content of their character is saying, what kind of person are they? I want to be, I want my children to be judged by that and not by just by the color of their skin. Okay, so we've got character. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Now, so character is different from attitude, you can see, because attitude. I could have a bad attitude today because I've got a headache and I'm just not very patient with people, right? So I've got a bad attitude today, but that's not my character. My character is what persists for a longer period of time. The, the way that I'm wired, right? That's my character. So that brings me on to this expression, uh, nature versus nurture. Um, keying off Rahel, Rahel's, Raheli's comment about your genome, right? So if you think about people, like what makes one person a good person and what makes somebody else a criminal, right? To use... To, to use extremes. Other experiments have been done or noted where you've got twins separated at birth, right? And one is quite unlike the other one when they grow up, right? Yes. And so this gives birth to this expression, nature versus nurture. And what that is talking about is there's certain things about you are in your nature. You're inheriting it from your parents and your grandparents and so on, your nature. Yes. You might describe somebody's nature as gentle or the opposite, aggressive or kind or cruel, right? Right. Your nature nurture has got to do with your upbringing because you nurture a child you know um you could it could even apply to animals well that dog is really aggressive because 
It wasn't treated well when it was young. It was always kicked. And so it's a very aggressive dog. Right? So nurture. nurture. Go ahead, Rahel. I said, could you espel it, please? Yeah. I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look up nurture on the web. Care for and protect someone or something while they're growing. Jarrett was nurtured by his parents in a close-knit family. That's the verb, to nurture. Nine, the action or process of nurturing someone or something. The nurture of children, right? Nurture. So it's got to do with the maturation, the maturing of the character as they're growing up. That's the, the nurturing. Okay, thank you. And, and so, so I don't know you really well yet, Raheli, but you have a certain character. Now, I would guess that a lot of the attributes of your character have been nurtured into you by your parents and your family. Okay, I got it. Thank yeah. you. So yes. that is that is nurture your upbringing, and so that what this gives birth to is this debate around nature versus nurture. How much of a person, when you look at them when they're old or when they're an adult, are wired into them? To use your expression, in the genome, how much is that? Yes, and, and how much is the way that they were treated up and the way that they were taught and the way that they were disciplined. Like it's well known, like we have an expression, if you um, you can spare the rod and, spare the, and spoil the child. So if a child is not disciplined and told what's right and wrong and punished when they do wrong, they'll end up as very rebellious and a bit of a rogue. Okay, thank you. So that's what the expression nature versus nurture means. I'll write it here. Nature versus nurture. Nature, nurture, and psychology. You can go and read all that up. Look at this. Nature versus nurture genes or environment. That's almost linking what we said, right? You were talking about genes, right? Yes. So you guys can go and look this up in your own time because it will take uh, the age-old debate of nature versus nurture. There you go, right? Nature, genes, hereditary factors, physical appearance, personality characteristics. Nurture, childhood experiences, how we were raised, social relationships, surrounding culture. And the truth is, that it's both these things contribute to how we are. The kind of person you are isn't all determined just by your genes, right? I agree with you. Yeah, okay. Right, we've done that one. We've done that one to death, as we would say. We've done it to death. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the next expression I want to use to teach you is Broken the back. Anyone heard this one? I mean, some no. solved it. There was a problem and I was cracked it completely, done and dusted. Yes, exactly. So the broken the back of it is you've, you've done the main thing. You've done the hardest part kind of thing. So um, here's Colin's dictionary. If you break the back or task of a problem, you do the most difficult part of what is necessary to complete a task. It seems that 
at least we've broken the back of inflation in this country, right? So there you're talking about, you know, inflation, right? We've broken the back of it. We've, we've managed to get it under control. We can, we can deliver supplies and work to break the back of the famine. Yeah, so breaking the back of a famine. Yeah, everybody comfortable with that? Yes. Uh, hello, Sueda. Thanks for joining. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. Are you all right? Yes, sir. Um, you've missed most of class, so you need to catch up on recording, okay? Okay, so okay. Right. Now, here is a word that was introduced to me, and it's a new word for teacher. It was introduced to me by EO. You guys know this word? Interdisciplinarity. It's a very, very, very hard word to say because it contains many, many syllables, right? Interdisciplinarity. <laughs> Have you guys heard this word before? I think yes. It is something between two major of science. Correct. That's exactly what it's got to do with. And I had never heard that even the word. And I thought, She's made a mistake because she's translating from Spanish to English. And I thought she must have made a mistake. I, in my whole life, this is a very long run, I have never heard this word. Um, yeah, the quality or state of involving more than one discipline. Interdisciplinarity is a fine thing, but it does have its limits. It's what's words are inter interdisciplinarity and education through research. Overall, the book exemplifies thoughtful interdisciplinarity at its best. Now, what's interesting is that all those three quotes are from the Times, right? The Times is one of those newspapers that you read if you want to extend your vocabulary, okay? <laughs> There's two newspapers in Britain that use extensive vocabulary. One is the Times and the other is the Daily Telegraph, right? Now, they're mostly relating the news and politics and all of that, but they tend to use language that you wouldn't find in the tabloids, the smaller newspapers, right? Which use more language of man in the street. Okay, interdisciplinarity. Right, here's another interesting word. And I could say it about interdisciplinarity. I could say it about that, and we'll use that as an example. A mouthful. What is a mouthful? Hard to speak. Right. Exactly. Um, You can also have a mouthful of drink, right, or food, right? That's that's you know, you know, the the child was greedy and he swallowed a mouthful, right? So he had stuffed too much in his mouth. So that that's one obvious meaning, right? If you just, but this is the one I'm on here, the singular nine. If you describe a long word or phrase as a mouthful, you mean that it's difficult to say like interdisciplinarity. I'm practicing that every time I say it because it doesn't, it doesn't trip off the tongue, right? It doesn't trip off the tongue. It's a mouthful. Okay. So for example, here, here is, here is <laughs> a friend of mine had a baby girl and she called this baby i mean i couldn't even repeat the name because right? it's like let me tell let me let me tell you what the name is right yeah 
Yeah. So she said, she sent me pictures of this baby and said, meet Araminta Blythe Theodora Brock. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I need to practice to say that. Araminta Blythe Theodora Brock. Right. I mean, none, of, you know, I've never heard any of those names. I might have heard of Theodora maybe, but. The kid will have a hard time learning the spelling of his or her own name. Words, yeah, they'll have a hard time in school as well. You know, what's your name again? Araminta? What does that mean? So, so I said, that's quite a mouthful, right? That was what brought that expression to my mind, right? It's a mouthful. It's a lot to say. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? Excuse me, can you consider it as an antonym for colloquial? Well, that's a good question, Rahel. No. No. No, but that's a good guess. It's a good question. Colloquial, our words or phrases are informal and used mainly in conversation, a colloquial expression. Of relating to conversation, denoting or characterized by informal conversational idiom or vocabulary. So I can see why you thought that, but it's not exactly the same. A mouthful is simply something that is a lot to say. You know, it's, it's hard to say it. That's what a mouthful means. Okay. Um, colloquial, you know, we would say, I would say this a lot, a colloquial expression. Scotland, Scotland has lots of colloquialisms, um, which I wouldn't even teach you because they're too specific to Scotland, right? Um, you know, like things like Curian, Curian, right? If you were sitting beside me and I said Curian, it would mean sit, sit closer, Curian, right? Or we would say can for knowledge. I could say can, can, mean, meaning do you know what I mean? Can, can. You listen to people, in, particularly in this part of Scotland, they always say can. Every second word's can, can, can. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crazy, right? These are colloquial expressions, right? Um, yeah. They say things like, it's a bra brich nicht the nacht. Which means it's a bra bright night tonight. It's a bra brich nicht the nacht. The nacht. <laughs> it's just nonsense, right? But anyway, <laughs> Scotland has a few weird expressions like that, right? Um, so that's what colloquial means. Not the same as a mouthful, but we know what a mouthful is. Right. Next expression. I want this is an expression I want to teach you. for loving our money, right? If you cannot get something or if someone will not do something for loving our money, it's impossible to get it or persuade them to do it. Example, you can't get hold of those tickets for loving our money these days. Very common expression in Britain, right? You can't, it's, it's impossible. It's, it's, it's lingo for it's impossible, right? You, you know, can't do it. You can't do it for love nor money. Make sense? Yes. Yes, so. Okay. 
Next expression, this is an expression I want you to, to know, which is to take notice. You ever heard of that, to take notice? So, I know bring to you, I, I want some, uh, bring to your notice, but take notice is I think similar to that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if it was me to you, I would say, I want you to take notice of this word. I'm asking you to pay special attention to it. Or I might say, I took notice that something happened, right? So, um, for example, the actions of Russia surrounding Ukraine at the moment have caused the whole world to take notice. Yeah, to take notice. So it's like, pay attention, really, really. Oh, there you go, <laughs> pay attention. Show signs of interest. When the show was broadcast, he made TV viewers set up and take notice. Right? That's another expression as well, to set up and take notice. Right? So if you set up in a seat, right, you know, you're paying attention. Yeah? You're not sitting back and relaxed. So to sit up and take notice. To become aware or give attention to something or someone, to observe or treat someone with special attention, take notice, okay? I want you to take notice. Right, now here's another good expression I want you to know. You and me both. You ever heard that? Anyone? No? Okay, I'll take, that. I'll take that as a no. So Anjali says one day, you know, I've never been to the Taj Mahal. I would like to go. My response could be you and me both. You and me both. And what I mean by that is I want to do that too. You've just said something and I want to do that too. You might say, I love curried monkfish. I could say, you and me both. It's a kind of an interjection that you put after somebody has said something when they've expressed a like or a wish or a desire, and you're saying, I've got that thing too. And uh, Shweta might say, I'm really looking forward to summer. And I say, yeah, you and me both. Yeah, just an easy reaction. You and me both. You used to tell someone that you're in the same situation, have the same problem as them. I'm completely confused. You and me both. Fairly simple, not very sophisticated. It's quite elementary. Used for telling someone, this Google Assistant thing annoys me. Um, used for telling someone that you're in the same situation, the same problem. Comfortable with that? Yeah? Yes. Sir. Okay. Mr. Emmett, uh, is it the same thing like um, when we agree, like me too? Yeah. Uh. Ex exactly. Uh huh. E exactly. Um, yes. You would say Thank me you. too when you want something like I fancy, it's really hot to say I want a fancy nice cream. I said that you could say me too, yeah, yeah, or, or you and me both, you, and, you me and me both, 
it's slightly stronger statement. It kind of means the same thing, but it's a stronger statement. Uh, stronger mean I more force showing my desire. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's uh, yeah, it's like you can say I fancy an ice cream. I say me too. Um, it's kind of like yeah, yeah. It's slightly nonchalant, slightly relaxed, right? But if I say yes. you and me both, I'm kind of like it's underlining and highlighting in yellow and underlining in red. Yeah, I'm really, really, definitely. Yo, yes, please. Yeah. Stronger. Some kind of, excuse me, some kind of emphasis on a common thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think that's a good point to stop, ladies. Since there's no guys here today. So we only got through about half the list as Anjali thought we would do. I'll put the date in so I know what date we did these words. 22.02.20. Okay. All right, thank you for all your time. Let me, let me stop the uh, screen share. Come back to here. Um, that was fun. I felt all those words were good and helpful expressions you'll find them useful try and use them when you're in class you know when you're writing you know try and use some of these things show off as we would say show boat show boat right mm -hmm. um because if you do that right what you're doing is that's how you're you're going to be able to remember it right and it'll be on the tip of your tongue right so when you really need it, yeah. you're not saying, what's that expression, right? You'll just, you'll just, I'll just come to you, right? Because you've practiced it. And so you'll say, you and me both. And you'll know the difference between cheap and affordable. And when to use tenure, when duration, when to say period. You'll know what the debutante is. You'll know, you'll say one day, I feel like a debutante. I've just arrived in London. And when you hear somebody saying a word like interdisciplinarity, you'll say, that's quite a mouthful, that. All right? Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> we will do that in the chat. <laughs> we will keep you in on your toes. You'll keep me on my toes. You, you guys always <laughs> do that. Absolutely. All right. I'll bid you all adieu. Adieu. Right? Which is French, but we use that in English, which means goodbye. And have a nice Goodbye. day. You too. Have a nice Sunday. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.